Hello, everybody. Welcome to this live stream event, Facebook Fatigue, Conspiracies, dig Digitally Born Photography, and How to Violate Community Standards. <laughs> My name is David Riviere. I am the Artistic Director of Paved Arts, located here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, Paved Arts is an artist-run center operating on Treaty 6 land encompassing the traditional homeland of numerous First Nations, including uh, Katunanaha, uh, Sutina, Woodland Cree, Stony Nakoda and Plains Cree in the west, Beaver Lake Cree and Dene in the north, Blackfoot, <coughs> Sioux and Anishinaabe in the south, with the Cree and the Métis nations spanning the entirety of the territory. We further acknowledge that the settler state of Canada has failed to honor Treaty 6. Paved Arts advocates, advocates for decolonization undertaken in good faith and as an imperative to learn from the indigenous worldview and thereby engage in sustainable land-based knowledge and practices. We are committed to involve uh, BIPOC artists and cultural workers at every level of our organization, including uh, 2S LGBTQ+, so as to reflect the spirit of this time and our community. I would like to thank our major funders who make everything that we do possible, uh, the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, Sask, uh, the Sask Arts Board or SK Arts, the City of Saskatoon, Sask Culture, and Sask Lotteries. And our thanks uh, for this evening to the team at the Collective Broadcasting Company for providing the streaming services for this evening's event. This evening, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the uh, two artists who will be speaking. Clint Enns is uh, the current artist showing at Paved Arts, uh, Internet Vernacular and Conspiracies in Isolation. Clint is a writer and visual artist living in Montreal, Quebec. Um, and uh, so anybody that wants to make an appointment to see uh, those exhibitions should just send me an email, artistic at pavedarts.ca and make an appointment for Tuesday through Friday, noon till six, and we'll put you on our shared Google calendar uh, with the uh, COVID capacity of five persons. Also joining us this evening, uh, many of you will be familiar with his work, uh, but the bio is very short. Uh, Mike Holbloom is a filmmaker who lives in Toronto. Finally, <laughs> I just want to invite everyone out there in the internet's land, it is a series of tubes, <laughs> to, to please uh, feel free to ask questions as we proceed through the talk. At the, at the end of the talk, Questions will be relayed to the speakers for response. And with that, I'll hand it over to the artists. Take it away, Mike and Clint. Okay, here we go. Um, Clint, it's good to see you in such good company with all these people we can't see. But I can feel them. I'm sure you can too. Here's, here's the first question. Oh, I felt that right in my sacrum. Your, um, your paved exhibition is made up of photographs that were made in your absence. Um, let's start with the most obvious question first. Um, you didn't ask for them to be made. You didn't arrange for them to be made. You stole them. Or to use the word the art world prefers when dealing with stealing, you, um, you found them and are now exhibiting the work of strangers under your own name. You know the old joke about the mom looking at a piece of contemporary art who announces to anyone who will listen, hey, like my 10 year old daughter could do that. In this case, her 10 year old daughter did do that. Um, isn't your show little more than plagiarism and laziness, a form of exploitation where you just reap the rewards of someone else's labor? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Uh, authorship is overrated. Um, as Guy Debord famously uh, said, uh, plagiarism is necessary, progress implies it, um, and embraces an 
artist's phrase makes use of his expression, erases a false idea and replaces it with the right idea. In these case, these images. Um, I am not saying I took these photos, but I'm saying I took these photos. <laughs> um, that is, I took them uh, off the internet. Um, I didn't pull the trigger or hit the button to take the photo, um, unless you consider it the download button. Um, so I did hit that button, I smashed it. Um, but like, let's go, go back a little bit. Um, in the early days of photography, it wasn't really considered an art form uh, since it was just replicating nature, right? In essence, uh, photography was simply plagiarizing nature. Um, it's just copying. Know, just copying, right? It was copying and pasting. <clears throat> At the art at a click of a button, if you will, um, the download button or the snapshot. Um, it wasn't an art, it was a science, and now it's uh, computer science. Um, but as we know, um, like photography uh, transforms nature, it transforms an image, right? Um, simply by placing these images next to each other in a collection, uh, I believe I'm transforming them. Um, into something new. Uh, in the book, they take on a new life. I place them into a new context and write about them and joke about them and things like that. Um, but- They appear projected on a gallery wall, but also in they're available in book form. They are available in book form, uh, but they're also on a gallery wall. They're usually different projects. The book is a very different project than the, than the slideshow. Um, and the slideshow is like the sort of raw archive. Um, it's like, uh, you can think of it as found footage or ready-mades, which have like their own sort of long history. Um, you can think like Deschamps is my lawyer, if you want to think in legal terms. <laughs> um, uh, Mike Zarid uh, wrote this article a little while back um, on found footage filmmaker Craig Baldwin in which he explores the roots of found footage. And he has a really um, interesting sort of uh, take. He says the the um, etymology of the phrase suggests its devotion to uncovering hidden meanings in film form. Footage was already an archaic British imperial and now American imperial measure of film length, uh, evoking a, a bulk of industrial product, waste, junk, um, and with this in which the treasures can be found, right? Um, found footage is different from archival footage. The archive is an official um, institution that separates historical uh, record from an outtake and much of the material used in found footage films is uh, not archived, but in private collections, um, you know, commercial stock shot agencies, junk stores, garbage bins are literally found um, in the street. And so I think about this. And so the found footage um, used comes out of this unofficial archives. Like, isn't the, the internet <laughs> the largest cultural trash bin that we have? <laughs> So people always talk about um, doing- We're adding to it right now. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the image dump, right? Posting way too many images at one time, the image dump, right? And um, like we go to the garbage dump, <laughs> or we sometimes call taking a shit, <laughs> taking a dump, right? The image dump. So I'm basically like collecting the shit in order to um, try to discover the cultural secrets hidden within. Um, very similar to the way conspiracy theorists might do this. <laughs> Connect the dots. <laughs> is that is that too much? <laughs> no, that was really good. Really good. Here's here's question number two. I've only got a few questions. Um, sorry, it's long. Um, a few years ago, you talked me into running for the board of Pleasure Dome along with yourself. Um, how can I ever forgive you for that horrifying experience? I'm sorry, Mike. Um, along the way, um, but as a result, I met up with these young people who, if they'd been born at a different time, say when I was born long, long, long ago, these smart, hip, talented, fast thinking, super efficient people would have been artists. But now we were in the 2000 teens and only losers became artists. What they wanted to be was curators, you know? Artists were a dime a dozen, a surplus, and mostly unwanted commodity, you know? Curators is where the real action is at. And besides that, there's a new sort of currency in the digital swamp 
besieged by the too muchness of our everyday lives. We have, um, so now we have record collections that have to be curated, photographs, just personal snapshots that need to be curated, social media posts, our wardrobes, perhaps even our friendships have to be curated. Um, sorry, this is such a long-winded question, but for me, one of the things your show reflects on is curator culture, except you make a neat twist on it by being um, both a curator and an artist. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I think I'm a curator and I think I'm an artist. Uh, <laughs> one hopes. Uh, I like the cultural cred that a curator might come with. Uh, you know that the curators have the power. The artists don't, you know. They've, uh, they control everything, um, including this sort of archive. Um, but a few years ago, when we were getting into Pleasure Dome, um, everyone was a curator, right? Uh, the internet invited this. Um, like, here's my little collection of what I think is good. Bunch of images, record collections, so on and so forth, it defines you. And so we all became like sort of uh, taste machines on our little Facebook page and things like that. Um, I, I like to think of Tumblr here, which is where we like sort of curate our collections and um, and it's kind of like represented what the internet was, which was like about appropriation, reca um, recontextualization and simply uh, copying. On Tumblr, you reblog things that other people have put up. But I like the, the best um, aspects of that, uh, which was when people would have really fun collections like do something really specific. Like I only post um... <laughs> <laughs> toilet shots. <laughs> That's where I get most of these images. I, but um, it's uh, it, like they would curate something like video game covers or something like that. And here are the best video game covers from 1980s and things like that. And, and then people would tap into that collection who had similar interests and steal those images and put them into their interests. Like I do this other thing, robot, um, you know, robot machine fights or something. And they're like, but that cover relates to this. And so it comes part of that stream. And I, I kind of like that sort of recollection, contextualizing and uh, copying. But to go back to the curator, um, it's kind of a, a strange thing. Um, like the curator used to be a cultural custodian, right? Um, keeping this uh, sort of um, uh, track of archives and displaying the archives and collecting for uh, institutions, keeping uh, our sort of, their, you know, content specialists charged with keeping uh, our cultural heritage, right? Mm -hmm. And so our digital archives are like really fragile. They can go away at any, any time, right? Um, like I think about MySpace and they lost half of their image collection. They're just gone, right? And um, I think for anyone who's ever had a had a computer crash, it's like, oh look, I just lost everything, or their phone dies, and it's like, oh look, I just lost two years of photographs. Happens every day, right? That's it. So now imagine you uploaded them to all your images to MySpace, and they're just gone there too, right? Or you forget your past. But MySpace actually lost half of the their image in their collection. They just don't exist anymore. And like if you think about Wayback Machine. Images at one time were heavy, they're, they're big, right? And so Wayback Machine wasn't archiving them, they were archiving text, which was cheap, right? Um, and they're, so they're just gone. So like, we'll never know, like, I don't know, what Goss kids were doing in the mid 2000s. You know, if that's your interest, uh, I'm sure that's a Tumblr. <laughs> that's how, can, how can we go on? Uh, we should that's just it. shut our, shut this talk down right now. That's it. Uh, so so much of the internet is like sort of um, on on document, and but there's other like questions here. Should we should everything be saved? Like on YouTube right now in this day, there was more movies uploaded, more hours of footage than one person's life. So if we just archive today, you could watch your movies from start to finish, and it would take you longer than your your lifespan. To watch everything uploaded today so like i kind of think like the curating is like i kind of think of like my images collection is what i think should be saved 
right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, like, I'm looking at that, and I'm like, that image, must, like, that image needs to be saved. <laughs> <laughs> That that should exist. Um, it it brings joy um, to the world, <laughs> and so um, so like yeah, there's something of in that. Um, I yeah, definitely. Um, like I I kind of think of myself as an artist. I, I thought like when I was doing film programming, I, I don't like the power that comes with it. Um, whatever that means, I have problems with power in general. Um, mm -hmm. So, like as an artist, I feel powerless, which I like. <laughs> There's the view it. from the bottom can be very clarifying. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like I always, I like to be downloading mobile all the time. Maybe it's heading heading straight for the. <laughs> There. Given the fact that your PhD led you into lucrative employment positions like um, furniture moving and pizza making, I I would say you've uh, what is that a dream come true? Um, yeah, no, that's it. Um, and, and enjoyable. I got to find all the found footage I ever wanted. <laughs> right. Even create some yourself. That's it. That's it. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's complicated. I but yeah, curatorial culture. I think that was a few years ago. Nobody nobody really views themselves as a curator anymore. When really? everybody's a curator- It's over. Yeah, I think it's over, I don't know. Like when everybody's a curator, I like- Oh, there's it's no not special anymore. anymore. Yeah, that's it. It's like, okay. it's lost all of its cultural capital, right? And like, it's just like, everyone's a photographer, you know? Like my mom's yeah. a photographer. She has an Instagram account that says photographer, photographer on it or whatnot, you know? And a video artist. Yeah, exactly. So, and a poet. Of course. <laughs> Um, there's, democratized. there's other photo artists um, that are working like you with found images. Um, and as a maker, you know, you've always been very um, encouraging, supportive of so many other people um, curating their work, talking them up. Um, I wonder if you could give us just one example of somebody else who's working in the field. Yeah, for sure. I, I want to, I'm, I'm actually going to do two examples here. Sure, so, sure. Two, two people are working. Because I think they're on opposite ends of the spectrum, um, and especially so uh, this found photography practice that I'm doing, um, I, I like this is like a pure practice, right? Like I'm just showing the raw images. So like let's think about this in the terms of its pure. And there's uh, only a few people doing this digitally born, anyways, uh, not analog, not vernacular photography in that way. But like famously Richard Prince, right, who just took inst Instagram images, just took a photo of somebody's Instagram signed it by putting a comment on it and then sells them for hundreds of thousands of dollars right like just directly from um and i think like that's that's an interesting practice right he's he's put his comment signed it um I, I think i'm doing something different i'm definitely not making the big bucks that that richard prince makes but um so it's yet. one end of the spectrum right um and calling into question all of these ideas around uh, appropriation and other things like that. Um, there's another artist that I think is interesting too, uh, Jason Lazarus, who's a Florida based artist. Um, and he has like a few pieces that I, I think um, do this uh, type of found footage work, like this pure sort of found footage work um, that runs the spectrum. One of them is recordings by him where he, uh, basically takes, I, I'm, I'm just gonna read what he, what it says here about his. Ooh. Yeah. Um, yeah, it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, he said, named after the photographs found in, in the installation, recordings number three at sea, continues my practice of assembling archives that explore the private and public meanings of photographs, as well as the nature of the medium themselves. Outstripping simple notions of nostalgia, these found objects evoke images uh, through what I've termed snapshot writing. The handwritten uh, inscriptions originally intended for a small, often intimate ob object, replaced now by hand, uh, hashtags that immediately become public, performative, and archival acts. Uh, this institution, or this installation, asks uh, viewers to engage with the photographic imagery in an era when you uh, image often fail to show us something new. Um, it is in the margins of the photographic medium that I find uh, meaning. So he basically in his show, he just takes the, the back of 
analog photographs and places them on the wall, not showing you the image, but what's written about the image. Um, and that's the snapshot writing. Um, and which I think is like a really um, fun thing. Ironically for Black Flash, um, uh, Jason quoted my series for of questions for experimental filmmakers, um, but he didn't cite me. <laughs> and I've, I'm using that as a joke. I was, I was very hurt. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to sue if Jason. <laughs> Oh, so funny. It was um, good. He, he had a, um, I think you were describing to me a project where he put a call out for pictures. Can you, could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, uh, the project's yeah. called THTK, uh, Too Hard to Keep. And it's basically, uh, he called for people to send him um, images that were too hard to keep, yet um, too painful to destroy. So uh, the ones that you couldn't uh, bring yourself to get rid of, but um, so um, his submissions uh, included photographs, slides, photo albums, memory cards, unprocessed films, uh, these types of things. Um, and he exhibits them just like that. He has a blog, uh, too hard to keep at dot blogspot.com. And uh, he does a call and he's, it's still open. So you can, you can contribute to this archive. Um, I, I, it's, I think it's a really um, sort of beautiful, um, a, a beautiful practice. Um, he, he has an, another one that's quite humorous too. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, it's not really related, but he collects all of the, the things that we use to uh, cover our webcams. So like pieces of tape, he asked people to send them whatever they use to cover their webcam. Oh. Mm. And uh, collages from that too. So another form of found object or ephemera. Huh. Very bizarre collection. Nice. Um, this show, the show that you're having at Paved, it's not the first expression of your interest in found amateur vernacular photography. Um, you mentioned already that you were very active on Tumblr, for instance, have been and are posting these accidental marvels. Um, I wonder if we could touch on some practical matters, like how do you find these pictures? Um, what kind of relationship does your Tumblr have with other Tumblr folks or just with other folks, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, amongst your many identities, I guess you're also a collector. How do you go about collecting new things? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I've, I definitely, um, I think I came from sort of, uh, as a, as a collector um, in uh, for the internet based stuff, um, it comes from publicly available archives. So it, they have to be um, publicly available. I don't like the pri like I'm not going to somebody's private password protective pages. It's just like whatever's sort of there. Um, for internet vernacular, I've tried to find, I'm trying to think through what it means for something to be abandoned in the digital age. How do you get rid of something that's online, right? Um, so it, it, like it doesn't go away. Uh, so it's just there. So I, I like I, I try to collect images that are over 10 years old now. So from the early 2000s um, by people that aren't still producing, that aren't at least updating to their pages anymore. I try to avoid artist based photography, people that claim that they're an artist. Like I'm an artist who like, who makes work with this. I, I try to avoid that. I want real vernacular, the real, um, the real like <laughs> photography, you know? Um, so this practice sort of came from an earlier practice uh, where I was collecting 35 millimeter uh, film from secondhand cameras at thrift shops and things like that. Right. <clears throat> I basically go into like, you know, um, Value Village or whatever and, and, you know, wind the film and then shove it into my pocket and then leave and take it to Walmart um, where um, they process it pretty much for free because there'd always, it was, the film was so dated that there'd always be some something wrong with it. <laughs> and they'd be like, this didn't work. Just take the photos. <laughs> and so they had like a really good money back guarantee policy. And, um, I, I went in almost every day to this Walmart on Readymead um, 
and I knew most of the people that were working there. And like, if you bring somebody to coffee, it goes a long way. And if you're not an asshole, it seems to like work in your favor. <laughs> um, like, because like those kids were yelled at all day. Like, where's my photos? You fucked everything up. They like, you know, and so you'd go in and be like, oh, you need a coffee <laughs> you need them for a week. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and, and, uh, and you know, the, the kids and what you're, what they're doing. And so I was developing these photos almost every day. And um, you're and developing, developing relationships along with photographs. Yeah, totally. Like there's this kid named Shades who played drums in a band and I went to see his band once. Um, <laughs> nice. it was super fun. Yeah, he was super rad. A young kid, like he's like he was 16 or, or something like that, but really cool. Um, this is or an early cell phone <laughs> that takes photos. I'm um, sorry. Um, on the image that was just there. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so boring from these cameras and developing them and um, really just enjoying like like I felt like I was a bit of like a voyeur of the mundane. So like, I really liked just seeing into people's lives and what they do. Um, like not like in a pervy way, but in like, like out of fascination. And when you start to see um, these large in image archives, like I'm only choosing one photo out of thousands, right? And, um, but I'm looking at all of those hundreds of thousands that the person puts up. And so you start, figuring out things about people and what they do. Um, I also started stealing SD cards from cameras, which I don't feel as, as um, it's more of a, it's like kind of a rougher practice. Is that, what, what are we looking at here, Mike? <laughs> I'm just moving around a bit, sorry. Okay, no problem, no problem. Um, um, what do you mean by stealing SD cards? Like I, I, when I couldn't find as many 35 millimeter images anymore, I started taking the SD cards from cameras, like the, from the cameras. So it was all the images that were on them. And then I started to like <laughs> do data recovery to them, which is probably not such an ethical act. And, <laughs> but like, I wrote my own sort of code. So everything would get fucked up. Like it would find half images and it would start building the images. So you got all these really nice glitches um in it but i don't know i like i haven't shown anybody that stuff it feels a bit weirder mm. um interesting yeah um yeah it's it's like it's a bit more strange um uh to to it's like i try to act ethically with this the stuff whatever that means you know yes um but like i don't want to i'm not it's they're like they're only they're only photos <laughs> 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 comes down to it. Um, yeah. Not true life confessionals. Yeah, um, so I'm how, sure. yeah, so you went from uh, taking 35 mil rolls to SD cards, and then at some point you just hop like directly into the internet land. Yeah, that's it. So like, and I don't and can know. You, can you talk a little bit about like, how does one begin to search for image archives or amateur photos that are over 10 years old on the internet? Like where... Um, so like um, with Flickr, for instance, you can search older, um, like for older images. So I do a lot of searches. I search usually by camera name. So they, they all sort of sort of put out their own format, format like IMG slash something or, so I search something like that. So you get a sort of pure archive, somebody who's not labeling their archive. Um, and sometimes those cameras just automatically upload to Flickr. So you get like every image which are, are nice. Um, and uh, so I, I was doing that. Um, yeah, uh, Instagram, it's harder. I don't know how I'd find somebody who's not active on, on Instagram, right? Um, it's like a, a, a bit more difficult, but I think this is like the difference between the, like the archive and the stream, right? Like Inst Instagram's kind of a stream of images. Mm -hmm. And Flickr is like an archive and there was a change. I think with Facebook, it became more of a stream of images and it kind of became like, look at me now. You wanted to show off what you were doing at this contemporary moment. Uh, whereas like uh, these archives were about preserving the past. So the, the argument I'm trying to make or, or, or trying to spit out here is that like the social function of photography has kind of changed in recent years hmm. from preserving the past to presenting the present. Yes, right. 
and so I'm, I'm looking for more of those people that are trying to preserve the past, I guess. Um, I don't know how I'd, how I'd search uh, Instagram at this point. It's too fresh, you know? It's easier to look at stuff in the past. But Flickr mm -hmm. allows you to do it. it. It has a little function, search functions. I look at MySpace all the time. It's another archive I use. Um, okay. How many people still have their MySpace accounts? You know? Mm -hmm. I, I still have my login, but. I guess you can take pictures from Facebook. I could, I, I, I'm not even on Facebook. Right, me neither. Yeah. Um, hmm. Neither is paved anymore. <laughs> 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 are, the, are you back, David? <laughs> yes, we are. We're back. You're back, okay. So, um, yeah. Um, did, did you find um, like your Tumblr, like do you feel like you're in communication with, or even do you feel like you're part of a sort of a, maybe, you know, community may be too big of a word, but like an affiliation or an association with a number of other Tumblr folks, you know, there's people like, oh yeah, you, or that you're sort of checking each other out or that there's this sort of micro scene or something, anything like that, I don't know. Not really on Tumblr. No. Um, I feel that more on Instagram. I think I, hmm. like, I like Instagram for those reasons. You start, or I'm in more communication, but I used to be more on Tumblr. I used to be more on Vimeo too. Like Vimeo started, it was a small scene and it was mainly experimental filmmakers, right? Now Vimeo's huge. And I like, but when it started out, like it was really like, like, like really contemporary experimental filmmakers. Like it's like Ben Russell's had an account, Jody Mack had an account like early on. And, and so you'd hmm. be like, sending me or Michael Robinson, kids like that. So you'd kind of that era of uh, experimental cinema, right? And yep. we all kind of knew each other. It was like, it felt like community. Um, hmm. Tumblr, I, because of the way I post on Tumblr, I'm not reblogging other people's stuff. So there's less dialogue. Right. The right. kids that do are in dialogue, but I follow a lot of people. Like I'm, that's where I, I get a lot of contemporary information from or whatever, like, you know. Mm-hmm. And so you so you acquire these or you uh, you amass these uh, these these pictures. Um, do you name them? Do you do you, do you, do you label folders? Do you how how are these things organized? Um, so on my computer, uh, I just I label them by date. Okay. And they correspond to my so I use Tumblr that way too, because you can have an archival function in Tumblr that gives you the date that it's on. And that way you can find that image in your collection. You can visually see it in your archive and then you can find it, right? Or that's how I use it. So that's like, um, you know, um, yeah, uh, that's, it's strange. So yeah, that's like, I use uh, Tumblr in that way as well. Um, I'm labeling them, but I, I allow them to take on different names as well. Like I always label them in the books when I use them that way. And they, they take on a name and it's kind of like, depending on what I'm writing about at the time, but then I'll like put them out under different names for like, <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter. It's yeah. Just, yeah. Um, so yeah, no, like they take on different names. I sometimes label them. I sometimes have names for them. Uh, most of the time they're just whatever the name of the, the, the flicker was in a, in a dated uh, folder that I can find via the Tumblr. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like, so I can see it and then I can be like, oh yeah, it's from that date. So it has to be in that folder. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a question from Aaron. Um, Quint, why did you take your films off Vimeo? I don't know. Um, they're probably gonna go back on at some point. Um, you had dozens of them. I had dozens of them. I, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I, got, I kind of got bored of like the film scene. If that makes sense. I got bored of the festival circuit. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, I'm kind of done with this for now. So I just started taking off work then. Bored uh, because it just became another place for like tyrannical self-involvement and neo neoliberal fragmentation and pitting everybody against each other and blah, yeah, blah, Yeah, there's blah. lots of competition, all that other stuff. I like friendly competition, but it's always like so trying to support each other at the same time. Um, like I like the tensions between those two things, but it's all comes down to like wanting to see people make better stuff. Um, yeah, the competition, I 
didn't really, um, I didn't really like. Um, yeah, I got kind of, I just got kind of bored. I don't know what that means. Uh, and I also like, I got tired. Like I didn't like Vimeo. I'm like one of the early members. I was like the first film. <laughs> now they're fucking holding my films hostage, trying to charge me because I, I can't put up another film. Aaron, I can't put up another one. I'm over, <laughs> I'm over storage by almost like 40 gigs or something <laughs> because they didn't have those policies early on. And then they just started being like, you can't post another one until you get a bigger account. Right. 40 gigs over now. <laughs> and I get a message <laughs> once a week. Like you're 40 gigs over. You're <laughs> <laughs> like i don't care <laughs> yeah, like, i don't know yeah um well that's a long these are some long questions Here, here's a message from david um the business model of a lot of social media involves the democratization of celebrity or the public marketing of the self um, the swamp of images as you called it um, is monetized through the proliferation through distribution of one's face connected to patterns that can be bundled and sold. Um, this marketing of everybody every day is a kind of tangible effect of the diverse images that you gather together in terms of the sheer volume. You know? Could you comment on hoarding as a strategy in this sense? Oh man, that's really hard. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, uh, um, yeah, like, this is one of the reasons I maybe don't like, this is like putting a dam in the stream, right? Like the images are now flowing and it's like, here's the dam. Uh, that like, um, I've used this a few times. Like I think about these things in terms of thawing and it's like the thawed, like they, they used to be a frozen moment of time as Susan Sontag would talk about, like we're freezing a moment and that sort of moment's thawed. And it's now just a flood, a flood of images, right? Mm -hmm. so this is like a way of like putting a dam in front of it and saying like, no, it's not a flood. Here's the good one. <laughs> like a curatorial like dam. <laughs> Here's what you might have missed. Most of these it, like um, images only have one or two views on, on Flickr as well. So it's like kind of saying like, no, this is actually an interesting image. Um, everyone sort of takes interesting images. Um, there's sort of like a democratic process within this. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I think photography is sort of a, a democratizing medium in general. Hit the button, you have an image, right? And uh, I think everybody has the potential to take uh, good images. Um, at least one in like a hundred thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll borrow, hopefully borrow that one image, find that one image. Those are the these are like, that's the fun of looking through this stuff too, is finding the gem, you know, like this one. <laughs> and usually it's like the images that go like, what is going on? <laughs> like always fun to find home repair, amateur home repair <laughs> or a sculpture. This might be sculptural art, you know, or, or, or this one. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's sharing a bone with a cat. I don't know. This is like, this is the fun stuff. The greasiest fingers you've ever seen. Mm. <laughs> um, here's, a, here's a long, long question. And it relates to what you've just said. Um, so ever since I've known you, you've appeared to me as a sort of an aesthetic communist. <laughs> I don't mean what the West thinks about communism, which as anyone who's ever been to Russia knows, never happened there. That's not communism, that's just dictatorship. By communism, I mean a radical equality, no more bosses, workers' councils, remember from Marx, workers' councils in place of the ruling class. In the art world, um, communism, aesthetic communism might mean taking down the great gods who have defined the field, which you've taken a swing at by par parodying or remaking classic moments of video art and experimental film. But it can also mean, um, this aesthetic communism might also mean raising the status of the amateur, the anonymous nobody who's never, who's never heard about art galleries, who hasn't developed specialist skills, and perhaps most importantly, specialist ideologies. I think one of the things you demonstrate in this bracing collection is that just plain folks all over the world are making pictures that are as staggering, stunning, beautiful, to use the old fashioned word, 
Um, these pictures are as beautiful as anything done by the great masters. In exactly this sense, I detect a strong politic at work in these disarming snapshots. It's a gentle takedown of the great masters, but more than that, the show itself is a kind of image of a great leveling. There's a sense that we might all actually be equal, equally creative, equally smart, equally flawed, equally hurt. It reminds me of the way you like to introduce people to each other, um, say at screenings or on the street. You often say, hey, Joe, meet Mike. He's a real superstar. Mike, meet Joe. She's a real superstar. <laughs> Like Warhol, you seem to believe that um, superstardom is a sort of state of mind. Yeah, yeah, I love I love uh, Warhol's um, superstars, and uh, the and I think that that's what the screen um, the screen tests do. Everyone's a superstar, right? Um, and should be and should feel like a superstar. Why not, right? Especially your friends that are making art. There's nothing else for you. <laughs> you might as well feel like a superstar. <laughs> you know, like, um, but. <laughs> taking the piss i just have to comment on this the superstar part <laughs> is only funny <laughs> if you add canadian in front of it <laughs> so here's canadian superstar <laughs> sorry yeah sorry. No, uh, it's yeah i don't know if that's uh that's my self-loathing canadianness uh coming in um no it's like meant to be fun i think everyone should do something that makes them happy um if that means hitting the gym or playing tennis or if it's about making art you know um we should we should do that um and this doesn't mean everyone's an artist but whatever who cares right like if you're enjoying taking photographs and want to put photographer on your instagram and have people check out and, and dialogue about your work um that's like that's great um like there's a social function to art as well with within this which i think is all like often overlooked um and it's like one of the important parts of art making is like interacting with people and relationships so, friendships relationships friendships people helping each other out or just hanging out together just hanging out you know hanging out in the dark room um like uh i think it's like in i think it's important um so it's like it's it's also like art should be fun like when did art get like boring like when did the boar snobs take over you know <laughs> like I, I it's that's not for me I'd, I'd rather and that doesn't mean like don't make smart work or don't like you don't have to dumb down anything for anybody or anything like that but it's like it's like there should be something enjoyable or you should I I I, I hate the other side of that or you sh it should be cathartic too right like if you're dealing with pain and that's a good way to deal with it, that's one way of dealing with the life's hard enough, you know, and if you can use art to deal with that stuff, it's good. So it's not just saying art can only has to be fun or whatnot, but art's, art making is pretty fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I think like there's, I like the democratizing, democratizing aspect of this stuff. Uh, I think that's why I like the snapshot, you know, it just requires the snap of a button. No, no need to, um, no need to even focus. Most of the most of the great images aren't in focus, anyways. <laughs> here's here's a quick question from Scott. How often, if ever, do you intervene with the photos that you find? Do you crop them? Do you edit them? Do you manipulate them? Um. Yes and no. Um. Yes. So well, I guess that's like. Of course, I edit. Like I I I make them larger. I want them all to be three hundred DPI so I can exhibit them, and then I do color correction and add some add some grain to them usually, um, like do some work to make them look the best they can, whatever that means, well, how I think they look good, um, which means like, um, you know, uh, playing with the contrast a little bit. Often like I find images that are just like 300 by 400, D, like, um, you know, pixels. And so you have to blow that up to be much larger. So mm -hmm. you have to do some work to that. You have to like blur it a little bit and then sharpen it when it gets bigger and do it in slower process. So you can pull out as much from the image as possible. Um, so there's like that type of work, like that, that stuff. I don't normally crop them. I sometimes remove stuff from the image. Um, like I'll do a quick little remove of something that's like, you know, 
yeah i try to make them look as good as i try to make them look as good as they, they can <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like uh, like this kid's boner has to look has to like it has to has to pop <laughs> <laughs> you know? and i had to remove some of the dust from this image <laughs> i wouldn't want any of the dust to get in the way of the doritos on the floor <laughs> there's a there's a I, I didn't do much to this image um but happy halloween um, <laughs> uh, why um Many, many moons ago, I caught a Museum of Modern Art blockbuster show in New York featuring vernacular or amateur photography. It was, um, it was vast, featured wall after wall of stunning encounters. And after you leave, after traipsing through so much downtown real estate, um, it's just you can't help but be overwhelmingly convinced that you've just seen a galaxy of so-called masterpieces, the very yeah. highest form of this art of photography. And it had all been done by unnamed and anonymous citizens who have now been collected by MoMA. Like they were not, a, they, the, the show was an, exhi an exhibition of their own holdings, in fact. Yeah, sure. For me, your show is like a smaller scale version of this, of this kind of thing. But it, yeah. really was, it really was astonishing to see how the, just the sheer quantity of the wondrous pictures that had been made. You know? Yeah, like, I, like I've, I really do like this this form of photography. I, I like I go to thrift shops and I'll look through thousands of these things to find that one photo too, and it just feels really good. Like it, there's something like about seeing um, good photographer made by non good photography made by non photographers. Um, but it, also, like I don't know, sometimes it's nice to find a photography collection too, as well. Like I, I bought these slides at one point, and they're all Chris Burke's slides. This like amazing photographer that nobody's ever heard of. He taught um, Robert Frank. So he was Robert Frank's teacher. The images are stunning. And I knew they were art slides because they were half frame. There's two images on every one. Oh. And so you looked in it's and like they're sharp. You looked like you and it's like, oh, I need this collection. And you know, I think I got the entire collection for like ten dollars or something. <laughs> like, I don't know. At some point I I'll probably put out a little book of his work just for fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they're super nice. Um, in black and white, uh, but they're all half frame. And he was doing at the time. He was. Uh, um, I've read a tiny bit about him, and he was like, he was doing it to save money. You know, you take more mm -hmm. photos if you shot half frame. Wow. Yeah, and they're good, but they're gorgeous. And they're. Um, yeah, he had a practice. He'd walk every day, uh, so you see reoccurring themes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think we could talk about some individual pictures? Yeah, we should. And uh, maybe we could start with the one with the yellow flower. If we could maybe just have a look at that picture. Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, a yellow flower standing inside a car parked up against the dashboard. One of its petals broken. And of course, it's plastic. Um, tell me something about this picture, Clint. I think it's missing a timestamp, um, like the <laughs> the um, the real like signature of the amateur, the timestamp, right? Um, it's I, this image is so so perfect. I like. Was this intended to be beautiful? It had to have been, right? But this was taken like in amongst like uh like i think the next photo in the collection is like somebody puking out of the side of their car <laughs> and I'm like, the next, um like the next image is like somebody doing a handstand at a, with a beer keg or something you know like <laughs> this was in amongst a bunch of party photos and i'm like this is like this is the pinnacle of art did they know did the person who took like you know the the lines like <laughs> just the the lines of the dash it's a masterpiece i, I don't know what to say I'm, me I'm it says like uh we have to hold out hope even when especially when there's no possibility of hope you know or even uh, just uh this is what i find beautiful and beauty is also another kind of hope another way of keeping my hope alive or of keeping myself alive and then after you take this picture, then you can just like curl outside the car, like <laughs> do a few handstands, you know, it's like 
<laughs> anything goes, right? It's like a new a new life already. Yeah, totally. I, this is, I, yeah. Um, yeah. Can we see the second picture? Yeah, I'd, I'd go with that. <laughs> um, so here's another here's another photo from the collection. It shows a woman flying, thanks to the magic of photography, the decisive moment. <laughs> For me, it says like. I'm a fucking superhero. <laughs> That's what this picture is saying. And I'm a fucking superhero, not because I can fly. Anybody can fly, but because I can fill my whole body with joy. The whole body at once is the teacher, said iconic New York avant dancer Deborah Hay. Here she is again, living with her whole body. And that can only mean the world is being turned sideways with pleasure. Should we look at number three? Yeah. I, I... I think this should be like, this needs to be a gallery exhibition where people just jump on like performance, jumping onto mattresses, <laughs> letting themselves go, fill the space. Love it. Oh. <laughs> Can we get this larger, <laughs> Scott? So on across this boat are the words, uh, bad girl. <laughs> And I love that it's like, like the reflection of uh, the top of a car, you know, the clouds reflected off the top of a car, um, reflecting the boat, uh, bad girl. Um, part of the collection is um, these images of, uh, of cruises, cruise vacation photography. That's a big thing, right? It's a big part of the vernacular photography. And uh, if from this collection, <laughs> one of my favorite things in this collection too. I have one other image from this collection. It's like, it's so good. They were trying to show off the towel art of the, of the, the crew. So there's, so there's all of these examples of towel art and they made, <laughs> they made a, a, like, I love it. Um, it's like, it's, this is another masterpiece, um, but it's just a photo of a boat, like a cruise ship. A, from stock imagery, they probably stole it. And it says towel art. <laughs> it's their collection of towel art. And it's like, it's fantastic. Yeah, the best, one of the best uh, types of um, amateur arts and is towel art as well. Sculpture. The next picture. <laughs> so let's make a couch sandwich of five pals our differences make us the same. At least for a moment, we're all having the same good time, even the person who drew the short straw and had to lie down first, lie down and bear the weight of all that friendship. We're still young and perfect, living inside someone else's furniture, someone else's mother's and father's dream of a life. We've hurt each other maybe, been hurt in turn, but not for keeps, not the kind that leaves scars later. We'll be friends for life, but in a couple of years, when the call to grow up and leave the old houses, the old neighborhoods comes, we may never see each other again. We're on the cusp of leaving everything we used to call ours, even this myself. No wonder I've got my eyes closed. No wonder even lying down feels like, no, no wonder that like lying down feels like work or play. One day this couch turned into a bed, and one day more, and this girl is gonna turn into a boy, a man, a woman, or something between all that. I, I, <laughs> I this ad. Um, except that stacking art. Remember when um, in galleries, we used to put um, artists, this was a big thing like 10 years ago, you'd find miniatures of stuff and you put as many of them in a gallery as possible and like stacking art. And this, I, I think, is an example of stacking art. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next picture. Don't be weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, this one um, is uh, was I was I was sharing one of the collections uh, with a friend with Leslie uh, when I was doing some some things, and I I missed I don't know how I missed this. Um, I don't know how anyone missed this. <laughs> um, this is a nice example of uh, why does this exist? <laughs> how did this happen? 
And I, I, I don't think we'll ever know the answer to that question. <laughs> Why this moment? Why is this weight set here? Yeah. Who uses that set? So good there's a picture otherwise. How could it be possible? That's it. It exists. It existed, and I'm glad it did. But no idea. <laughs> Next picture. <laughs> um, for me, this looks like a conversation between a sheep and the camera person. For me, it's an image of uh, colonialism. The sheep are grazing, and there isn't much there. Look at how painfully skin and bones they all are. What cuts across the mountain slope is the ski lift, the abandoned machine skeletons waiting for the seasons to turn. In order to make what I don't want to call a real picture, what I'd like to name a true portrait of the ski lift, the photographer has somehow managed to arrive half a year too late. Not, not when the mountains are billowy white and the human gladiators are conquer conquering the world with their downhill preoccupations. But instead, the photographer arrives in the off season when the people are gone so that we can see what's happening behind the curtain, what lies on the other side, the back of the photograph, as you mentioned, the back of the image. Or in other words, the cost of doing business. Isn't this sheep saying, you fucked our land, you fucked our food supply, now what do you want? <laughs> and yet there's still something welcoming in this sweet face, never mind the privations and terror. Somehow the underclass is still willing to forgive. Next picture. No comment. <laughs> yes. Um, the only thing this image says to me, um, and I, this one's included in the book, and I just, this is what Trump meant by make America great again. This is all he could have meant by make America great again. <laughs> That's it. That's like the Miller's light <laughs> into the mega cup. Um, is it a mega cup? A mega cup? The, and I'm sure that was used for Slurpees prior. Um, but yeah, America 2003. <laughs> it's mega all the way. Mega all the way. <laughs> um, next picture. <laughs> um, why do I find this the most disturbing of all the pictures on display? This baby doll looks like it's being held up to the camera, posed, ready for its close up, ready to be put on display. But wait, in place of touching up the makeup, one last tweak has to be made. The man's large fingers pull the skin at the back of the baby doll's head, squishing its multi gendered head, accentuating this otherworldly astronaut. I'm a god temporarily taking this form, quality that many babies have. What haven't those deep blue eyes already seen? There's a casual cruelty in this picture, like the way a childhood remark, a nickname carelessly tossed off um, might be. How vulnerable we are in our flesh bag of a body filled with nerves and circuits that provide us too much information. And while we would like to wear only the uniform of this kid, the soft flannel with its pastel colors, abstract shapes taking the place of the S is for Superman sigil. In place of the softness, there is the hard company of a man whose anger keeps spilling over. I guess he doesn't know his own strength, or perhaps he knows exactly how strong he is or how weak his charge is. Some children, it says here, are made to be squeezed like this, broken by the ones they depend on the most. Next one. God. Oh, so this, like, this is like, you can go to a gallery and see a professional show and see this image. And this image is there's two images in this collection that were interesting. The other was a person running from the police climbing a tree <laughs> from the perspective of the person they were running with. So it's like the police lit, like reaching up to them. Um, 
very bizarre and but this was in the collection and uh like th i think this is what i mean by uh voyeur of the mundane this is precisely what i mean by <laughs> voyeur of the mundane <laughs> Yes, let's leave no stone. Let's leave no window unturned, <laughs> That's unseen, it. unglimpsed. Um, next picture, I think this is the last one we're gonna talk about and we're at 9.30, it's been an hour. Oh man. Um, what to say about this threesome, two boy men and a female. The photographer is lost in a flash of light, obscured by the apparatus, the machine of reproduction. On his left is his buddy, whose gesture seems to be tied somehow to the act of making this picture. He's on a couch, his arm leaning over the edge, his arm raised as if to shield her from the unwanted and aggressive glare, the overlighting. That's the good guy read. Yeah. The bad guy read is that guy is gonna hit her in the face. Yeah. There's definitely, uh, this one, um, like part of the collection is what happens before and after these images. Why was this image taken, right? And this image speaks to that. Um, is, are they playing a game? Are they playing a sweet game of like the slap, you know, where you slap your friends and uh, who gives in first? I we used to play that in uh, the, the prairies all the time. <laughs> do, do they still do that, David? <laughs> No, <laughs> no comment. Uh, that would be yes. Yes, be yes. <laughs> yeah. So is it is it um, is it that, or is it uh, something more aggressive than that? Is this a fight? Is this that moment that they've just caught? Um, like, but the flash, as well, isn't by the person who took the photo. This isn't in a mirror, you know. Oh. So there's another perspective of this uh, image as well that we'll never know. Hmm. Um, the person whose hand is raised, um, his face is a kind of a pointer. So it keeps the heat off him. Like my, you know, when I look at his face, it just, it just slides right off his face and then right back to her, you know? And the camera is also pointing and both dick faces are pointing at this woman who has to close her eyes because of the heated up pressure of this menage a trois. How did that old Barbara Kruger saying go, your gaze hits the side of my face. In her original copy of a photo made in 1981, um, Kruger offers up the head of a white statue showing a girl woman, not unlike this one, except with blank eyes and razor sharp cheek cheekbones a blank ideal, a story waiting to be written and projected. Kruger's photo text, your gaze hits the side of my face, addresses both the person who's taken this photograph, the photographer in the room, but also of course the viewer who is presumed to be male. Her, her text, her combination of text and picture is a feminist addition, an intervention into a history that's been handed down like an unwanted inheritance. Amongst other things, these two pictures, yours and Kruger's asks, how can I have a face when you're the one who's doing the looking? Or worse, how can I keep from looking at myself the way you're looking at me now? The violence of pictures and the way that violence lives inside our bodies changes our relationship to our own bodies, wouldn't you say? Yeah. That's, it's, it's very nice. Oh, okay. I think we're done. <laughs> Can we sign off? <laughs> it's 934. Can we go? Can, Can we, I just thank, close this? Can we thank everybody? Um, oh, as thank well, you. I, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who's watching. Uh, we can't see you or, or whatnot, but uh, we believe you're there. Um, I'd like to thank everyone at uh, Paved Arts, uh, David, Travis, and Lindsay for their invitation to show Internet Vernacular and for putting on this uh, uh, this talk and for putting up with um, the banning of their personal Facebook pages for a tiny period of time. Um, I hope they had a nice uh, break from it. Um, uh, thanks to C CBC for technically putting on this show, yeah. <laughs> the CBC. Um, 
with Scott and Colby be, that are working behind the scenes uh, to make all of this happen. And uh, thanks to Mike for agreeing to have this, uh, this very pleasant conversation and for his uh, insightful readings of these, these uh, images. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, uh, Mike, I, you know, I've been watching the comments coming in on the sidebar and uh, a lot of people feel as I do that your uh, readings of Clint's images are lovely and uh, really uh, insightful and provocative uh, and or thought provoking. Uh, so uh, thank you for, thank you both for uh, this evening and uh, certainly Clint with your work at the gallery, I hope people will, um, you know, see this presentation this evening and, and make an appointment and come down and see the show if they're in Saskatoon, uh, check it out uh, while it's still up. Yeah, um, up for one more week, I think. Yeah, yeah. so uh, with that, uh, I guess we'll say, uh, uh, um, have a pleasant eve all and uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Yes, take care. See you shortly. <laughs>